Hi, my name is Eric. Welcome back to my channel. Let's talk once again about Madonna. Today, as you requested, I'm going to react to her 2019 album, Madam X, the Spotify Deluxe Edition, and break down the album's lyrics. Before I dive in, let me know in the comments down below what Madonna album I should react to next. Check the description box for a link to a list of nonprofits you can donate to. Please subscribe to be here when I post new videos every week, and hit the bell icon to be notified when my videos go live. This is a fairly long album at 15 tracks, so I'm going to pair songs and listen to them and analyze them together, just so that I don't end up making an overly long video. Without further ado, track number one is Medellin featuring Maluma, and track number two is Dark Ballet. Okay, Madonna goes full reggaeton. It's a beautiful life, but I'm not concerned. I can dress like a boy, I can dress like a girl. Cause your world is such a shame, cause your world's obsessed with fame. Up in it's a beautiful place. This is definitely a lot more austere and spacious than the first track, which was a lot warmer. <laughs> okay. Why does she sound like a Disney villain? The storm isn't in the air. It's inside of us. Can't you hear outside of your supreme hoodie? The wind. It's a beautiful life. Okay, yeah. Two very, very different songs. Like I said, the first one was very warm and reggaeton influenced, whereas the second was so much darker and so much more menacing. It had these really surprising and sort of audacious twists and turns that remind me a lot of Jockstrap's EP from earlier this year called Wicked City. It's so funny too, because these songs share this dance motif that has recurred throughout Madonna's discography, but the first one had this sort of conventional approach to opening a pop album that we've seen on albums like Rina Sawayama's Sawayama or Jan 
and at Jackson's The Velvet Rope, where you sort of call your audience to enter into a world with you. And then the second shows us that world, sort of open the curtain to something really, really odd and bold and interesting. Because Madonna opened the album on Medellin with her talking about a trip, both a literal trip and a drug trip, and that song was just all about escapism. She talks about being naked and free and feeling like a kid again, and then Maluma returns that with saying, you know what, I'm going to support you, you're going to be my queen, it's all this very idealistic sort of stuff. And because of that, it all exists in fantasy, the hallucination of this drug trip, or really vacation even. So as always, love and joy being uninhibited are in some way incompatible with reality. And she extends this idea to Dark Ballet, where she brings back some of the ideas ideas from American life, talking about presenting different ways and trying to meet people's expectations but still failing to do so. But of course, this many years into being the Madonna, she has a different sort of approach to how she looks at the world. She has less emotional baggage and almost more of an objective outsider perspective. On the chorus, she talks about the world being obsessed with fame and up in flames. Again, just like on American Life, conflating this sort of hierarchical elitist culture with any other number of the world's ills. And on the bridge, she's talking from the point of view of like a martyr, a Joan of Arc type character, talking about being judged and burned at the stake. And of course, that's a literal retelling of the story of Joan of Arc, but also a metaphor for the way that Madonna feels that she's been scrutinized and shamed as a public figure, which again is another idea that she's talked about in a lot of her other music. Track number three is God Control, and track number four is Future featuring Quavo. Oh, that was a turn, okay. Just a kaleidoscope of so many different ideas and elements. Okay. Yeah, at the end there with uh, Quavo's verse talking about crucifixion, sort of feels like it ties back to the earlier sort of reference to Joan of Arc, the sort of idea of public judgment and sacrifice. 
But let's talk about God Control, because this song seems to pick up where American Life left off, except this time Madonna is even bolder and more specific with what she's trying to talk about. She says basically that the American dream that she reached on, you know, American Life and Hollywood is just not attainable for most people. She describes this as a lie, and she goes so far as to say that kids today have no chance to get a decent job to have a normal life. And she describes this as the blood of innocence, and then she gets more specific about really sort of what she's aiming at with that gun loading and firing sound, and of course talking about on the chorus, I think the only gun being in her brain. So with that chorus with the choir, when they're saying we've lost God control, if they under enunciate the D enough, it starts to sound like they're saying we've lost gun control. To me, school shootings are the clearest literalization of the idea of sacrificing the next generation, where allowing children to have harm, physical harm, enacted on them would be a sort of neat and convenient metaphor for their economic exploitation if it weren't also a thing that actually happens. So to me, God control is not only a progression from, but also an improvement on American life because it's more specific. Future is a little bit less specific. Madonna returns to reggae, which is a genre that she hopped over to briefly I think on erotica, and she takes the sort of broad brush of the reggae lyrical themes of optimism and social commentary, basically saying that one requires the other. She talks about faith and inspiration and being complete and positive, and then intersperses some lines about opening up our minds and learning from our past. So when she basically sort of chides us for not being conscious enough, and again mentions crucifixion because of course she does, she's basically saying, sort of in the same vein as a song like Easy Ride from American Life, that if you want a bright future, you've got to put in the work. Track number five is Batuka, and track number six is Killers Who Are Partying. Tying back to earlier. I love the drums. Okay. There's a lot of vocal processing on this album. The percussion is so cool on this song. Very, very cool song. I'm enjoying this piano motif throughout the album. Stop. 
Wow. I think this album has some of the most interesting combinations of sounds out of all of Madonna's music. So Batuca, according to Google, references the Batuque style of music from the island nation of Cabo Verde, and it incorporates the lyrical styles and motifs of like a spiritual or a protest song saying basically that fate will bring us to a brighter tomorrow. To my knowledge, Madonna doesn't have a direct connection to Cabo Verde, but the intention of the song is very clearly meant to be uplifting. I do think this album in general does raise questions as to who can use what musical styles and when, which are questions that I'm not equipped to answer, but I appreciate that this song has exposed me to a genre of music that I otherwise would not have been exposed to most likely, and that it's being used to spread a positive message. As far as lyrics go, they aren't super conclusive, they mostly just use the same sort of tropes of wind and storms being representations of change is going to come. So it brings back the wind motif from earlier on the album. And she talks about, you know, this long journey to, you know, a brighter tomorrow, which also calls back to Easy Ride from American Life. But then on Killers Who Are Partying, Madonna actually seems to explain her adoption of these different musical styles to say that if she sees someone who is in a position of being oppressed or marginalized or mistreated, she wants to put herself in their shoes. Like on the first verse when she says, I'll be Africa if Africa is shut down, I will be poor if the poor are humiliated. So looking back to the prior track, her performing batuke is an act of mimesis. She is putting herself in the shoes of people she is trying to understand, and the way she does that is by performing their role musically. This also might explain why she sings in Portuguese on this song, saying things like, the world is wild and the path is lonely, again tying together themes that she's sung about for decades. Track number seven is Crave featuring Sway Lee, and track number eight is Crazy. Again, totally different sounds here. Okay, yeah, so I think those songs were two 
definitely of the more conventional songs on this album, but they were also really fun. The first of the two, of course, was more trap influenced. The second was more influenced by traditional pop, but again, sort of more in the vein of the music that was being made or and is still being made around now and in 2019. But I think the most interesting moments on this album are when she takes those influences that are very of the moment and branches out and does her distinctly Madonna thing. On Crave, we moved from the political to the personal, as is Madonna's style, and as usual, she talks about the intensity of her desire. Here she compares that intensity to cravings, so her love is like a dependency, and as she says, it is dangerous because it makes her vulnerable. This also might tie back to the opener because a craving could also refer to a drug dependency. This might be supported here on the bridge when she talks about the love that she was looking for being inside herself all the while, which, you know, on the one hand, more optimistically, could be just about self-discovery and self-love, but on the other hand, could be about finding it in herself through the high of a drug trip. On Medellin, love existed in a drug trip, so of course, if that's where you go to find love and fulfillment, then you would develop a dependency on that. And that in turn, of course, breaking out of the metaphor, speaks to the risks of being dependently in love with someone. And then we get another dimension of this type of intensity of attraction on Crazy. The sound of that song brings to mind traditional pop and pop soul, and coincidentally, I was actually just recently listening to 60s girl groups like the Ronettes and the Supremes, and something that struck me about that music was how those singers performed femininity. Specifically, for the most part, their lyrics were mired in this very rigid power dynamic, and the language here of foolishness and intoxication and irrationality very much speak to that. And as some of you pointed out to me after I watched the Oh Father music video, Madonna has spoken in her music and of course visually about this sort of cycle of being mistreated by her father and then being mistreated by her partners. So that still seems to be a preoccupation that Madonna grapples with even after all these decades. Track number nine is Come Alive and track number 10 is Extreme Occident. Okay, I get it. Repetition like a cycle or a circle. Interesting. Okay, so again, she performs this sort of interest in her sort of global perspective through the sound, and then she complicates that, says, you know, I actually didn't need to be looking all over the world. I didn't need to be, I guess, this global touring superstar to be finding fulfillment. 
And so in the transition from crazy to come alive, we have this movement from the past to the present or the future. We have this heavier vocal processing and more electronic music elements, as well as lyrics about rocket ships. But more specifically, we have Madonna saying that she's going to step up to the front lines, use her voice and work for peace. So to Madonna, moving forward means claiming her power and using it for good. So come alive then is a call to action. And then of course on Extreme Occident, she explains a bit of the background of how she came to this conclusion. She talks about going to the ends of the world looking for answers because she felt lost, but all along she wasn't actually lost. And this is because there was no one place where she could find herself. The world is a continuum. It is all one constant. And that's good because it endorses a message about humanity as being one, which then is useful as an argument against any sort of divisions that we have as people. But on the flip side, that makes it harder for Madonna to locate herself in any one community. She feels unstable and unsettled, which brings to mind the problem that she had on American life where she tried to go to a bar looking for sympathy and she didn't find any. So Madonna uses her icon status to position herself at the sort of vanguard of justice while also acknowledging that it's risky and isolating. Track number 11 is Faz Gustoso featuring Anita, a cover of a song that Google tells me is originally by Bulaya and the title translates to Make It Hot. And track number 12 is Chime Loca featuring again Maluma. <laughs> Okay, the song slaps. That was a lot of fun, and I definitely mispronounced the title. Okay, two really fun escapist tracks. I apologize for how I'm mispronouncing Faz Gustoso. I speak Spanish, not Portuguese. <laughs> and like I said, that song operates as a story beat that we've seen on a lot of Madonna's other albums where dance and clubbing can be an escape from the outside world. But what's interesting is that we see the outside world creeping in through these motifs of drunkenness and recklessness. And of course, through the celebratory music, the positions have flipped and now the guy is the one losing his mind here. Well, actually maybe it's mutual because from the translation that I found, we've maybe got some cheating and seduction going on. So even though this is a more upbeat moment on the album, it still coheres nicely with the broader lyrical theme of disorientation. And then on Chime Loca, which I'll translate here and there, Madonna is in the same sort of mindset. On the chorus, she talks about wanting to kiss this guy and then being scared by him. And what's interesting is that from Maluma's perspective, she's this bad girl character, like from back on Erotica. She's wearing designer clothes and partying with her friends and she's scared of nothing. And what's interesting is that we also carry over these implications of cheating from the prior song when Maluma talks about Madonna being left by her man and going out looking for someone new. And so there's this back and forth of them acting all big and tough 
and seductive with each other and then having these multiplying layers of disorienting dishonesty underneath. It's chaotic in a way that evokes like the sweatiness of a nightclub. I mean, not that I would know, but I imagine that's the vibe. So just like she felt lost on Extreme Occident, here she embraces that feeling of instability where dance music, which of course as always coincides with romance, channels that sense of chaos into something gratifying. All right, track number 13 is I Don't Search, I Find. Track number 14 is Looking for Mercy. And the final track, track number 15, is I Rise. Finally enough love. I don't search. I find. I found love. I found something new. Platinum. Get another but reference. And that is how the album ends. So I Don't Search I Find picks up where Extreme Occident and the prior two party-leaning songs left off, with Madonna being uncharacteristically resolute. She's got everything figured out. She's found love, she's found peace, she is done searching all over the world for answers. And for a moment I was like, okay, where's the catch? We have two more tracks where Madonna can complicate this sort of happy ending. What spurred this change? And I think it was the music itself because this is another club leaning song, it's a house song. And so Madonna has always found answers and solace in her music and that's what she's doing here. But that's too simple of course. So on Looking for Mercy, Madonna circles back 30 years all the way to Like a Prayer with her again begging God for personal peace. And once again, we have this difference between the outside and the inside, like on 
Chaim Wilka, Madonna and Maluma perceived each other differently from how they were feeling inside. And here, of course, she says that she keeps all of her pain and trouble inside, and that prevents her from connecting with other people. But to me, that's interesting because she spent so much of her discography being so open and vulnerable. So maybe her making songs like Oh Father and Mother and Father and Inside of Me are her sort of circumventing normal human interaction and spilling her guts instead to a sort of anonymous wall of millions of people. That's feeling like you know someone, not actually knowing someone. And she could frame this on some level as a failure to connect with people, but she turns it around from a different perspective, again on the closer I rise, where she envisions herself once again as a leader and as a fighter. We have all these sort of expected images of pain and trauma like bullets and tears, and she says that she rises above it all. And this isn't in spite of those struggles because the triumph can't exist without the pain. In fact, she says that she is not bulletproof and later that freedom's what you choose to do with what's been done to you. And of course, this is both personal and political. And so she sends us off with this message that we can take our struggles and our pain and use them in a way that's productive, not just for ourselves, but for our world. Overall, I think this is one of Madonna's most ambitious albums, not just lyrically, but also sonically. She has these lyrical themes of changing the world and improving herself and these sounds that are brought from different geographic areas and different genres to create something really interesting. And because of that, I think this is one of Madonna's boldest albums, both in the messages that she's sending and in the music itself. My mind keeps going back to God Control because I think it best epitomizes what this album does well in its confluence of musical influences and its very specific, straightforward political message. So I think it'll take me a minute to decide exactly where this falls in Madonna's discography, but for now, I really appreciate this album's ambition and boldness. So thank you to all of you who recommended that I listen to this album. As always, let me know in the comments down below what music I should react to next and what other topics you'd like to see me cover on my channel. Check the description for that donation link. Please subscribe to be here when I post new videos every week. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you are staying safe and healthy. And until next time, that's it.